Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? All right, we got a. This is a weird show today. Uh, my name is uh, Michael, and I'm here co-hosting with a one Eric Ingram. How are you this it's, evening uh, today? It's true. I'm I'm kind of in a weird spot after uh, yeah, this double feature. Yeah, me too. I I can't figure out. And, and so you'd think we'd be in a weird spot because of uh, the one film we're doing today. Right. But we were actually spiraled into a very. Um, it's a it's, it's a, a kinda... dark complacency, I think. Yeah. Wow. That's um, you put it. You put it very well. So the films we're covering today. We have uh, Todd Browning's Freaks with, uh, as promised previously, the most surreal David Lynch film, which is obviously called The Straight Story. <laughs> I hope no one was misled by that. Yeah, I don't see why there would be. Uh, you know, every hundred shows we can afford to just piss the audience off. That's fine. We have a website now, so it's okay. That's true. This is show number 200 for us. Oh my God. Congratulations, Double Feature. You That's... made it to 200 shows. Do you know how much I care about making it to 200 I, it's shows? It's an arbitrary number. It I don't care really at all. Matter. It doesn't matter. I do think it's funny that uh, our 100th episode was our first David Lynch episode, so that's right. kind of nice. All that says is we are planting David Lynch episodes every 50, which uh, makes me feel pretty good. Yeah, that sounds about right. Freaks in the Straight Story is a very strange double feature. It is a strange double feature. Uh, it's, I guess, I mean, I don't know what the exact theme would be. I think it's probably something along the lines of... Uh, outsiderism sure yeah i can um, see that there's a there's a weird family aspect yeah to both of the films definitely. i you're better at coming up with the actual you know there's a i'm when we talked production with this stuff we um we've been wanting to do freaks for That's a true. long yeah. time and we always thought we'd have an opportunity because it's very short and we have a lot of films that are very long and just trying to find time to do all the films and record and edit and all that stuff and not have too much to talk about uh, of course, Freaks, there's a ton to talk about, too. So it yeah. was a tricky one. The other problem with Freaks is, um, you know, usually we have all the problems with the David Lynch stuff because I'm really whiny about getting the mood <laughs> correct on the David Lynch shows, right? But uh, with this one, Freaks, I mean, it's hard to find something tasteful and come it's up with true. a theme. It's really easy to just pick on something where people are weird looking or something is being exploited and just go, that works with Freaks. Well, or even the opposite. I mean, I don't know if we're going to talk a lot about Elephant Man at any point being a David Lynch film and uh, having tie-ins sort of thematically with Freaks. But that's one that obviously came right to mind. Sure. Uh, Freaks and the Elephant Man, you would think perfect. But then you think uh, Freaks and the Elephant Man, like you can't do that. You know what I mean? So it, it was very hard. And so we looked at this other movie, The Straight Story, it's got a little bit of that double feature humor because it's called the straight story. Right. And it's very not what you expect. And it's uh, very clean. And it's hard for me not to make puns about it. It's a right. straight film. It's straightforward. Yeah. And uh, before we get into Freaks, I think it's probably uh, customary of us double feature hosts to warn you that we're going to spoil Freaks as much as possible. We're going to spoil the straight story, really. We're just going to intentionally spoil and ruin both of these films for you. And if you don't like that, that's why we have chapters. Yeah, you can utilize the chapters from the chapters menu to uh, to skip around. I'm going to do something I don't usually do if you happen to find yourself in this episode. Freaks is a movie from the 30s. Uh, it feels a little exploitation-y, uh, you know, in, in packaging. And The Straight Story is a David Lynch film that is G-rated. And those are the two movies we're talking about today. Yep. So if you haven't seen either of those and you feel that piques your interest because it's weird, see those movies and then skip to the parts in the show where we talk about them. Freaks opens up and it says, uh, in ancient times, anything that deviated from the normal was considered an omen. Uh, I think an omen of ill luck or a, a representation of evil. Right. How very much things have changed. Actually, I kind of feel like things have changed. Yeah. You know, that still exists and uh, we can look down at it, but I don't want to be cynical about it at all. I think humanity is clearly progressing. If this movie says anything, it's that humanity is progressing. That's true. Uh, In the 30s, some woman from the screening actually tried to sue MGM 
as, as the legend goes, right? Because she said she uh, had a miscarriage after watching this film. That's bizarre. <laughs> the reaction that this film garnered, even after it was edited... Caused her to abort her own baby. Was, uh, and well, then she blamed MGM. I don't know if... <laughs> She had a miscarriage, man. I don't know. I don't even know if this actually happened. It probably didn't happen. The stuff you hear about freaks, and I'm going to, you know, we're both we're both factual and science-minded people for as much as we delve into fantasy on the show, watching sure. movies all the time. I don't want to give anyone any misinformation. However, this is a really old movie, and a lot of it, the story behind the movie is fantastical. Yeah. So it's hard to know what's true and what isn't. The story is a, a great anecdote for the popular opinion, whether it happened or not. The heart of what it's getting at is that uh, people had a very adverse reaction to this film. Right. Even just talking about or portraying a taboo like this in cinema, uh, you know, the film was banned from the United States, uh, I, whatever that means, a ban, right? But apparently there is actually a law, if the internet is to be believed, that was never repealed and still exists today, banning the showing of the film Freaks. Uh, that existed in the UK as well, Australia, I mean, a lot of different places. The UK had their longest ban in film history, uh, or one of their longest bans, until this was finally granted a rated X status. Oh my God. Not until the 60s, though, that they reevaluated that. So it's a, a movie by Todd Browning, who is a guy you want to know about. Absolutely. It's called Todd Browning's Freaks uh, a lot of times when it's displayed. And if you don't know who Todd Browning is, he, um, he did a Bela Lugosi's Dracula, right? The yeah. 1931 Dracula. He's a guy who, uh, he worked in a traveling circus when he was younger. I think that's probably where the attraction sure. of the story came from. But he convinced the studio that, you know, they wanted to adapt what was at the time a, a story itself, not something that he personally had written. Right. Something called Spurs, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think they mentioned that in the, in the, the first title card, card. Yeah. Besides Dracula, which is one of Browning's bigger movies, he worked with Lon Chaney, um, Lon Chaney Sr. for a lot of stuff. I mean, uh, The Wicked Darling, The Unholy Three, The Unknown, and then directed this based off Spurs, which was Clarence Robbins, who did The Unholy Three, who wrote The Unholy Three as well. So they'd worked together before. But I think the most interesting piece of Todd Browning stuff for me personally is, uh, I'm obviously his body of work that actually exists is interesting. But there's sure. this thing called London After Midnight. I don't know if you're familiar with this. Yeah, I've heard, I, I, think, I think I've heard of this. I've made jokes about the band London After Midnight, so that could also be yeah. it too. <laughs> which might have excited people who knew about the film London After Midnight. And I was just referencing a band instead. There is uh, London After Midnight is probably the most well-known lost film. Uh, a lost film being a film that doesn't exist. You can't watch it. It was created, usually created, edited, done, sitting on a shelf somewhere, or maybe even displayed in a theater for some time. But you can no longer get it today because it does not exist anywhere. And so if you wanted to see London After Midnight, you can't. <laughs> MGM had a studio fire in the late 60s uh, when, you know, films still use nitrate. That's the Inglorious Bastards right, thing, yeah. right? Isn't that about nitrate? Mm -hmm. It was just highly fucking flammable and people's movies burned. And so the studio only kept one copy of this. Uh, I guess this was the last copy of this film. And so when MGM had that big fire in the 60s, it destroyed the last copy. So Browning, I mean... He made another movie based off this called Mark of the Vampire, right. uh, which I think has Bela Lugosi as well. Yeah, I think it does. So you can kind of see, you know, what was London After Midnight. But then this awesome thing happened a couple of years ago. Uh, Turner Classic Movies hired someone. They did restoration of, uh, basically, they recreated the movie based on the script and production stills. Huh. I haven't seen it. I don't know what it looks like or how authentic it is. But that was this project that they undertook, and it's it's the closest thing you can actually see to London After Midnight, sure. save, you know, waiting around, hoping, well, save Mark of the Vampire, or the, the hope that everybody has, that film enthusiasts and collectors and, uh, and you know, fans of this, this lost work. Will rediscover it somewhere. Yeah, would-be fans, I guess, of the lost yeah. work. Wouldn't that be great if it came out and it was just fucking awful? Oh, yeah, that's, that's what I hope for all the time reloose the film just burn the film all over again yeah i mean that's the hope that that it's somewhere that it exists somewhere 
But uh, I love that it has enough notoriety that TCM actually did that restoration. So a large deal of Freaks is considered lost as well. It's uh, it's probably a whole half hour that yeah, the studio... Yeah, they cut, they cut a ton of stuff out of Freaks. The original runtime was a full like 97 minutes. and Yeah, so what version, is this? The thing we watched today. We watched a version that was 64 minutes. And sure. I, think, I think we got... I don't even think we have the original ending on the version we watched. No, I don't know if the original ending still exists. I don't think... Yeah, I, We I have the little tacked on Happy Studio right, Get Back exactly. Together ending, which wasn't, you know, wasn't Todd Browning's actual ending. Right. Well, the big fear with the ending of the film had to do with the fact that people didn't like that Hans let them kill her because he was sure. supposed to be a good, benevolent, heroic character. So they tried to tie it up and say something along the lines of, oh, he had no control over what his yeah. freakish brethren would do. Yeah, there was also a lot of stuff in Browning's original cut that kind of damned uh, the rest of so-called normal humanity sure. a little bit more. Well, they touch on that a lot in the intro thing. Yeah, I think that's definitely still there, but it makes it, um, you know, losing that stuff makes it a lot more a story just about these underdogs and holding them up rather than to say that the normal people are the evil ones, although they are the, the crux of the uh, dire narrative. Yeah. So the big fucking deal with freaks, the reason it's too hard for audiences and everybody's losing their mind over it is that it doesn't use effects or makeup, right? It's not a, uh, not costume. You know, the casting claimed authenticity by using non-traditional actors. Sure. The people portrayed in Freaks were, in reality, what they appeared to be on screen. And a lot of them were from uh, Barnum and Bailey, right? Yeah. The, uh, what Barnum and Bailey themselves at the time called the Freak Show. That was, I mean, this isn't a satire or a play on anything right. or a critique or criticism, commentary of any sort. This is called Freaks because if you went to that exhibit in the 30s, yeah, there was this a freak show. Freaks. I mean, yeah. that's just part of what happened with circuses. It was a circus sideshow. It was, uh, I mean, it was a way for, a, they say it in the beginning, but it was a way for a lot of people who had these kind of deformities to make money. In in England, they, uh, they would bring over, because a lot of deformities, even now, but back in the 20s and 30s, mm-hmm. a lot of deformities and, you know, freakish types would, they would bring them from the Middle East and Africa and India and literally bring them to just squares in England, sure. pay sure. them money and have them stand for two, three hours. Sure, right. Stand in the court to be this, mocked. But yeah, but this was a way to make money. This was a way to take something horrible that happened to you and at least, you know, use it to your own benefit. Sure. I think of it as empowering. I understand sure. that they're made fun of and mocked, but I think that if you can look past that, as as a as a person and go mm. i can utilize this as part of my personality so you know the the worst thing you can do is say all people who are afflicted in a certain manner feel a specific way about something right and clearly the people who are working in this sideshow it's a job for them some of them probably hate it some of them might be self-loathing some of them probably love it a lot of them seem to be having a good time. They enjoy the camaraderie. And then we don't see the side of a lot of them who don't work there because they think it's exploitative. Right. So, you know, that was Freak Show, Barnum and Bailey Freak Show. I think that was before they were even uh, Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey, greatest show on earth. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like that actually serves to make the movie less offensive, that it strives for that authenticity. I think it's, um, when we look at it all these years later now, that's why it's not insulting over time, right? which it might have been regardless of the intent of the movie or how heartfelt it is or what its its moral objective is. Mm-hmm. It might come off, I mean, it would come off very different had they used sure. actors and had they used costumes and makeup. What we're looking at here is authentic back then, which makes it authentic now, even if it's no longer accurate in a modern sense. Even if we aren't, you know, in the same society we were then. Sure. This is now a look back at what society was then in the most authentic way possible. The thing we want from seeing a film like this. There are a couple people which uh, in a casting lineup would be considered normal actors. Olga Baklanova, uh, I think that's how you pronounce it. She was the female lead, I suppose, sure. in this movie. Uh, she, she's the tallest woman in the movie. Yeah. That's, how you, that's how you know who she is. 
She apparently had a really hard time around the cast. I mean, it it physically disturbed her, not in a way where she felt, um, you know, not in the mocking courtyard type right. of way. Sure. But in a way where, I mean, having not been exposed to a lot of this, that's the reason people gathered around it. That's right. why it's called a freak show. It disturbs something in you. It's uh, it's very realistic to say that people come up against that and it makes them uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Some people want to see that. They've never seen it before. They want to know what this this piece of life is about and... For her, I think a lot of it was that it was tragedy, that it was sad, but it did overwhelm her. Well, a lot of, I mean, it's scary. A lot of the notoriety for Freaks is that it's, you know, one of the, quote, scariest films or has some of the scariest moments of any film of all time. And the film is not by nature a horror film. No. I mean, it's made by the guy that made Dracula, but it's not, it's not the same thing as Boris Karloff as Frankenstein. It's not... Mary Shelley's dark evil. Well, that's how you know is because you know what it looks like when Todd Browning makes a horror movie. Sure. That's most of the movies he's made. This is half drama. It's, it's kind of a romantic drama twisted into a weird setting and it's utilizing the setting to tell this story of a romantic drama over the backdrop of a circus fucking sideshow. Yeah, but they knew at the time. Sure, I mean, I mean that's what attracted yeah. Todd Browning to it. I think. Yeah, the movies he made, a lot of that probably came from his own background and kind of growing up in that and having, let's say, an interest in the more macabre. Right. I mean, I think that would lend itself to. I'd say that's true of myself. I watch a lot of horror movies. How often on this show have we gone on about sideshows? Sure. You know, that's just something you become interested in. I like tattoos. I like piercings. I like David Lynch films. But they knew. I mean, even when they were making it, they fucking knew. They, this was made in old school Hollywood in studio lots. These guys are there filming. And, you know, the other cafeteria attendees basically made them sit outside on a, a makeshift stand to eat because they didn't want them eating indoors with everybody else. With upsetting all the stars. All the, well, yeah, upsetting all the actors. So, you know, there were two or three people or whatever from the cast who were notable enough to sit inside. Probably the two or three, uh, again, what they would call the normal people. So the question becomes, as you're watching this, a, a movie with a lot of unique history, what do you actually get out of a view? Like, what's contained within this film? And I think outside the notes you've already touched on, um, being exposed to a lot of this stuff and what it says thematically about, you know, lifting up these people as the underdogs or the, the sense of um, family that they have between them. I mean, for me, a lot of what this movie is, is uh, that scene with the guy who's, who's billed in the carnival sense as the human torso. Sure. The, uh, the guy who doesn't have any arms or legs. Pillow man. Seeing him light a match, uh, it's, there's another version or a, a longer take that I don't know if it's part of the Lost Where footage. Where he actually or rolls the cigarette it. as well. Yeah, have you seen yeah. it? I haven't seen it, but I know that it was part of his, it was part of his sideshow act in his career. That's, I mean, it's an incredible sight to see that. It's, uh, the film treats it so well. It says, oh, this is no big deal. This is every day for him. He's just in the middle of a conversation doing this. And, you know, again, the creators know that this is going to be really showy. That's why it's on film in front of you. But they choose to put it in there as if it's just a normal everyday thing. And that's, I mean, that is fascinating for me. What people can... uh, what people can learn or skills they can develop, not because they want to, but out of sheer necessity. Right. How good you might get at doing something that I would never have even thought about uh, when you're in a position where you have no hands or legs. I, how do you do that? It says this, really this incredible thing about us as people, our, our ability to adapt to a situation that's terrible or, or just to adapt in general. The fact that we can learn and we can develop these skills You know, you could say the same thing about uh, musicians or artists or craftsmen, anybody who can dedicate their life to to doing a certain thing. And then when you really, I mean, I say dedicate your life if you're a craftsman or whatever, but uh, this guy, if you are the human torso, you really dedicate your life to using your mouth for everything every day because that's your tool that you have to work with. So you become the best user of mouths on planet fucking earth. That's what we're witnessing right here. Right. A lot of people may not realize that when they show up for this sideshow, 
but you are looking at the, the single man on earth who is most trained to use his mouth for unorthodox methods. What does that look like? Well, we know what it looks like. It looks like this guy right here. And that's, I think, a lot of what attracts me to, you know, circus side shows and freak shows and things of that nature. Of all the people who are in this film, who are non-actors or natural actors or whatever, actors get all uppity when you say uh, non-actors, but whatever you want to call that, not sure. traditional actors. Um, Angelo Rosito actually kind of got a career after this movie. Yeah. Well, he, you were telling, you were telling me that he ended up in Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome and he's uh, right, what right. he's master from Master Blaster. Sure. That's sure. a huge role. Yeah, it is. That's a an iconic role. role. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. I don't know how much stuff he did before this, but you know, having seen the Mad Max movies, uh, and then recognizing him in this yeah. is fucking surreal. The long part he had in, uh, Beretta too. Uh, and then in the he was in the '80s version, the Disney version of Something Wicked This Way Comes. Most of his films, if you look on his IMDb, most of his stuff goes uncredited. There's that sad little uh, parentheses uncredited next yeah. to most of the things he's done, but he's gotten a lot of work. Which ultimately, it's sad to say, but that's a huge stride for you yeah. know, someone in his position where. These people are looked to in scripts because, oh, we need somebody weird for this role right. or who fits this bizarre position. You know, what can we what can we find? And so the fact that he's getting all of this work at all, um, a credit would be uh, would be nice beyond that. For most of the people who are in this film, um, I was reading this is, you know, largely the only credit they were sure. ever given. There's another thing in this scene that's really iconic, too, and where a lot of people who haven't seen Freaks might recognize it from. It's that dinner scene. Yeah. It's, one, you know, it's a horror moment Yeah, where they're all sitting down to dinner and they're accepting the, the, the woman who's a normal person, but they're accepting her as one of the freaks, as one of the brotherhood. They're welcoming her into sure. the fold. And it's supposed to be this innocent fun little moment where they're, you know, they're chanting the, we accept you. We accept you. One of us, yeah. one of us, Google gobble. But the reality of the situation and the legacy of the scene is one of us, one of us. Yeah. One of us. I mean, really more people probably reference this scene sure. than have ever they seen know the what freaks. it is. Yeah. You right. just know the, the repeated cantation of one of us means be part of our creepy group. <laughs> yeah, it's weird the things that become popular from this, or even the way the movie became popular in general. I mean, in the 30s, there were uh, there were moments where people were lining up around the block to see Freaks, but on a larger scale, I don't think it was really a very notable movie. Sure. It didn't become uh, really very popular until the 70s, until the Grindhouse era. Which is great because it's a it's an extremely unique example of a movie that wasn't created for the exploitation era, right? But was so loved by the sure. people of that era that I it mean, became a hit. It's really it's the first stride towards exploitation I think that cinema ever really made. How do you mean? Well, because you have this film and it's kind of designed to capitalize on, you know, it's essentially if you were to film a circus sideshow, sure. They give it a story, but the story, I mean, let's be honest, it's not a strong story. Sure. A lot of the film is a reason to catalog and display these people and their talents and it the is, way yeah. they live and the yeah, way you're they right. are. It's very exploitative. I mean, in that it's nature. exploitative, but not in a dark, it's not in a capitalistic way. Sure. Um, it's more just the film is not necessarily about what the film is really about. Right. You couldn't have done a documentary, especially in the 30s, obviously. Sure. You couldn't have done a, a documentary on something like this. But what's also great is it's from the fucking 30s. Yeah. 30s to 70s. I mean, when we talked about Repo, we talked about the fastest turnaround cult DVD thing ever. Mm -hmm. And here, this is probably the longest amount of time between, you know, before a movie finds its, its following. But that exploitation uh, kind of angle to it is what drew me to the film, aside from the, the fascination. You know, we used to do a thing on our show where we would give people who donated sideshow names. And I think that probably came from uh, a big love of Carnival, too, which yeah. was a show on HBO that comes up every once in a while. It was a two-season good versus evil kind of uh, mystical. It's hard to describe yeah. Carnival and make it sound as amazing as it <laughs> was. 
But it followed a traveling sideshow, and it also had this kind of dark magic bent to it. But even the the modern day stuff, the real stuff fascinates me. I like seeing what human beings have done to kind of harken back to that day. Sure. You know, when we think about um, how maybe modern medicine has, you know, cured so many of these ailments. Right. We still have the lizard man and Enigma and Katzen, these people who will, you know, undergo prosthetics and tattoo work and they will make their bodies their own. Right. Well, we have the Jim Rose Circus Sideshow from the 90s Yeah, uh, was this weird traveling. It was like it was big with alternative music. Sure. Uh, It was in Lollapalooza. They opened for Nine Inch Nails. It was a very strange, wonderful thing. Yeah, right. But Jim Rose would always talk about how there are no natural freaks anymore. A freak is a state of mind. It's a state of committing to being fucked up. Sure. You have to tattoo yourself or Jim Rose was body mutilation. Yeah, yeah. Um, But that's what a freak show is now. It's not so much being born without arms and legs. Come look at the weirdo. It's normal people being a display. And then there's the straight story, which is the second film on the show today. Yeah. Um, all right, so I'm going to throw out there the thing that blows my mind. Okay, the thing, one singular? The one thing that blows my mind. Please do. And then we can we can go into the mini things from there. Uh, Walt Disney Pictures presents a film by David Lynch. Yeah. Never has one incomplete sentence, really, uh, because I believe a film by David Lynch probably has a comma after it. A film by David Lynch entitled The Straight Story. Sure. David Lynch is a weird guy, and I feel like maybe to understand this a little better, because if if you weren't prepared to hear about the straight story and didn't know what it is, your mind is being blown wide open right now. Uh, This is a G-rated Disney film by Mr. David Lynch. Yeah. Uh, There is no kitschy irony to it. David Lynch is not an ironic guy. Not in the slightest. A man with a sense of humor, probably one no one but David Lynch understands. I thought maybe if I could kind of consider the other strange things he's done, Mm -hmm. maybe I would get this more. Sure. I, uh, I mean, he's a guy, he's done the, uh, the morning weather every day for wherever the fuck he lived, California or whatever. Um, LA, Yeah. but he'll put out these video broadcasts of him with his cup of coffee, just giving you the weather, these YouTube videos. He has, uh, David Lynch, uh, cooking quinoa, the fucking website, uh, has all these short videos on it now. In fact, since Inland Empire, it's been mostly video shorts distributed through his website that he's made. So he's a very bizarre guy, and he has a lot of odd interests we've been exploring through his movies. Right. But then to find this, I mean, this came at a really interesting time. It's uh, it's 1999. Okay. This is after Lost Highway. But before Mulholland Drive. Exactly. Now, it's sort of before Mulholland Drive. Okay. He's in a weird place here. He had begun work on... He'd basically done the Mulholland Drive TV pilot before the movie was made. Right. Submitted it to ABC, and ABC fucking hated it or whatever the hell happened, and they passed on it. So he's in this spot where he hasn't quite figured out we're going to make a movie out of this or who knows what's going on in his head at the moment. But here is a straight story, uh, a movie that is unlike his work in uh, the content, I guess, really is what I mean to say. Uh, the G rating, you know, when you don't, uh, when you haven't seen the movie yet or you don't know anything about it, a film, a fictional film based on a true story about a man who rides his riding lawnmower from across Indiana to Wisconsin. Yeah. I, it might as well be across the country, right? It's yeah. 200, 300 miles or whatever. Uh, that's weird. That's really bizarre. And he didn't write the screenplay for it, too, which I don't know if that makes it more or less bizarre. I think that may be the first step to understanding it. Yeah, I think so, too. He's directing someone else's screenplay, which isn't common for him. Yeah, I was going to say. So it's Mary Sweeney who did Mm -hmm. the screenplay, who was his longtime girlfriend. Uh, Eventually, they got married and divorced 10 years ago or something. Okay. But for a long time, while they're working on all these big films, um, and until rather recently, Mary Sweeney did the editing on his movies. She edited Twin Peaks, the both the series and the movie, uh, Lost Highway, Mahal and Drive even. They, they were still together at that point. And she was the assistant editor on Blue Velvet and Wild at Heart and, and produced Inland Empire. So she's worked with him on a lot of stuff. This one she actually wrote. She co-wrote it with somebody else. She basically read this article about this guy, Alvin Strait, and decided to retrace his journey to try and acquire the rights to a film. 
So, you know, she's talking to a lot of these people that he met along the way, like actually coming in, sure. having encounters with them, and then spending the years getting, uh, getting rights for this, something like four years. Alvin Strait actually died before they even, even huh. made the movie. I think, what does the end of the movie say? 96, I think? 96, right. Yeah, so that would be 99, you know, the movie comes out. So here we have his editor writing a film and then editing this film as well. Uh, I think this was the first one she did on Avid. This was the first they did digitally before David Lynch got super into digital stuff. I think Inland Empire was made on mini DV or something. <laughs> it's made on video. But uh, Lost Highway, when we talked about that, we talked about a lot, of, a lot of good classic filmy stuff. That was actually cut on film too. Yeah. We've never really talked about the editing process, but people used to edit on film uh, in machines, as crazy as that sounds. Or to some people, as crazy as it sounds that I'm treating it like it's right. crazy. But that was the last one they cut on film. And then she started using, she used an editing rig called Avid, editing software called Avid, which um, I'm a Final Cut person, so I've talked about that a lot on the show. But sure. Avid's an alternative yep. to that. At the point that she had written this, Lynch wasn't convinced to direct the movie. Uh, she basically hoped he would executive produce it. I think she'd kind of talked him into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, then after reading the screenplay, he was basically convinced. And, you know, I think that was always her hope is to get him to direct it. Sure. But he looked at it and, you know, when they were talking about this story or whatever before the screenplay was around and he said, you know what, that's a great idea. Best of luck with that. Totally not something I'd direct. And I, you know, I don't know what really went into that decision. It's impossible to say, right? Yeah. I'm sure he was moved by the story, like he you says. You have to be. But you got to think about that play season, too. He poured his fucking soul into that ABC pilot. He had done Twin Peaks. He had done Hotel Room, which was another, a really short-lived series. But he was obviously trying to get back into television. He thought he had this incredible thing. Well, he did. He did have an incredible thing, yeah, with uh, Mulholland Drive. And ABC, for whatever reason, I mean, if you ever read the interviews of him talking about why ABC passed on it, he just sounds broken. Sure. He just sounds... Uh, I would be. Who wouldn't be? Yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes, you know, you're optimistic about it. You say, well, maybe somebody else will do it, or they're all just miserable fucks, and they didn't like my artistic mm -hmm. vision and whatever. But I remember reading an interview where he was just like, you know, sometimes I just, I don't understand people. It was yeah. just this fucking depressing... You know, and then he reads this and he's he's warmed by it as I think people who then see the movie are. Absolutely. So he does it with Angelo Badalamente. And, you know, when you and I watched this, uh, neither of us knew what to expect. I mean, the opening title, the fucking G-rated thing. We're, um, this is a very stripped David Lynch. Sure. It's still the same, you know, photography style. It's still the same pacing when the camera's moving. It's all, it's just nothing bad is happening yeah well that's um, the uh i mean that was the big surprise yeah well and that's what's terrifying is because i'm used to those angles and those shots and that cinematography sure being synonymous with terrible scary things happening yeah and tension and instead it's just a way it's a you know it's a lens for this story yeah it still feels like david lynch yeah, and i mean absolutely. from the beginning yes you know, I anticipated going into this movie and seeing something made by David Lynch that doesn't quite feel like David sure. Lynch, but it is David Lynch to a T. In fact, if I had not known that David Lynch did it, I would have gone, what's up with this weird movie that's copying these strange... You know, right. we've talked about on other David Lynch shows that nobody makes films quite like he does. Sure. And hyperbole aside, I don't even mean that in a bad or good sense. I fucking love David Lynch, but I'm not trying to build him up as, well, no one makes a film like he does. Yeah. You know, not in the classic Orson Welles. No one made films like Orson yeah. Welles. I literally just mean you cannot find that distinctive signature anywhere. And when you see it in a straight story, I mean, you do see it in a straight story. You're right. It's that, that fluid camera movement, the, uh, the real Lumberton that yeah. we had from Blue Velvet. You see the kind of the motifs, the farming equipment and so forth. Those things that he's not trying to put in the movie. He's just magnetically drawn right. towards them. And it's even it's even that scary opening. I mean, when uh, Alvin falls, yeah, you know the way it zooms into that, that the window. window and it gets quiet, and then there's the thud that just a little tiny payoff. You and I are thinking there's no way this is G-rated, yeah, but nothing even happened. Right, it, it zoomed into it. You know, the whole time in my head, I'm uh, 
forced to block out the internal dialogue about, well, what the fuck, MPAA? What makes a G rating anyways? Yeah, what does that even mean? Absolutely. How many times can I say goddamn in this movie? And you have things like the, the cut to the grain elevator, which is apparently what that sound is. Right. The terrifying David Lynch sound <laughs> is, uh, uh, who knew, a grain elevator. But then you cut back to that endearing man, and he says, ah, oh, the sound of that good old grain elevator. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> He's not okay aware. Again. He's, yeah, he's in the scary David Lynch thing. The thunderstorm is one of the, the biggest ones for me, where they're staring out the window kind of toward the beginning. Sure. And there's those thunder cracks, but there's also the light and the, the music at the end of the scene. It's the point that I realize it's doing the same things to me mood-wise. I'm getting the same internal feelings that I get from other David Lynch films. I wouldn't even set this aside from his collection. This isn't one of those things where on your proverbial DVD shelf, you have Blue Velvet, Lost Highway, and Mulholland Drive, and that's your trilogy of David Lynch's best epic work. Sure. I think the straight story just kind of goes right yeah, in it there. Yeah, it does. It really does. It's, it's, it's the content that's different. Yeah. The filmmaking, but the craft still is still there. So the feeling obviously is. David Lynch. And I mean, it's up to David Lynch caliber, too. It is. It's a, it it's is. a bizarre fucking gem of a movie. Yeah, I mean, right. That it seems like all of his movies are yeah. in their own way. Uh, I almost wouldn't have it if it were just another lost highway. It was, sure. uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that if I didn't see Disney in the title or know it's rated G, I wouldn't even really question that David Lynch had made it or that it was one of his films, that it was in his right. collection. I would go as far as to say it feels more like his stuff than, you know, things like Elephant Man or, yeah. or Dune, especially. Dune, especially Dune. Always especially Dune. Except maybe space at the beginning and end. The spice must flow. But again, on the other side of things, I mean, I can see him making it. I, if you know a little bit about David Lynch, or even if you've just kind of seen Twin Peaks... David Lynch is the guy who is probably at home right now. Well, it's late at night. He's him by late. I mean, 8 p.m. He's probably uh, in bed, but, you know, he's going to wake up in uh, eight or nine hours. He'll wake up at four in the morning and he'll make a cup of coffee and he'll put on his, uh, you know, flannel Lumberton shirt and probably eat a piece of pie in the yeah. morning. He'll cheat a little bit. He'll have some pie for breakfast. David Lynch in a human existence sense is so congruous with Alvin Strait. He is, he is, he's just, yeah. he's got to do what His he's got to do. coffee and, and cigarettes, it, right? It's all normal. He just has a couple key decisions that him and myself agree upon, film aesthetic and taboos sure. and, you know, forcing the, the dark internal, very internal ideas and internal nature about man onto celluloid. But right. aside from that... He's not Salvador Dali or Andy Warhol. Yeah, yeah. He's not going out and living the Lady Gaga vogue yeah. of being David Lynch. He sits by the fireplace in his slippers. I hate that all I can give him to do is the things a retired person would do. Maybe he should be chopping down a tree or something. So now that we're getting a better understanding of the movie, some of the things that are really great about this are, uh, you know, they shot it in chronological order. It was uh, on the, the path that Alvin actually took. So they're shooting those scenes. And uh, they shoot this thing and they bring it to Cannes. And that's when, you know, Disney bought it. So they made the film they wanted. And I don't know if Cannes legitimized it or what, but Disney obviously saw the film. This wasn't the kind of thing they had to pitch to Disney. Sure. I don't know if that would ever happen. I don't know if you pitch to Disney. Yeah. Well. I'm pretty sure Disney uh, generates most of its... Uh most of its media. Well, you got to remember Jerry Bruckheimer and Disney are a thing. I don't remember you know? Jerry Bruckheimer. Look, my point here is that Disney's a studio like anybody else, like, say, Merrimax, for instance. So they see this film, they go, this is a good film for us, and they buy it. And the thing that I love is that Disney had no impact, one, because they weren't around beforehand, but two, even after they got the rights, they didn't change a fucking thing. They put their name in the title credit, and that was the end of it. Now it was Disney Presents, a David Lynch film, instead of a David Lynch film. And the rest of the thing was was the exact same movie. Mm -hmm. The pace of it is one of the things I like the most. It takes its time. It's a, uh, it's a very relaxed journey. So the movie itself, you know, to mirror that, is a very relaxed sure. film. It's, uh, besides from the, the floating camera kind of cinematography stuff, it's the absence of quick edits. It's the uh, the deliberate sequencing and the 
the ability to make you feel like you're on that Midwest kind of adventure. Right. That you're actually traveling the road on a riding lawnmower, despite that I'm sure it was a, a little bit corn more. For weeks. Yeah. And weeks. It was a little more painful than the movie probably made it seem. You're not actually in a helicopter looking at the Midwest. You're at eye level staring at corn. But that's because we want to connect on an emotional level that we weren't actually there smelling the corn. Right. We weren't there experiencing that Midwest nostalgia that he probably was. So we recreate that through these slightly larger than life shots. What's great hand in hand with that is there was a point where we had to rewind to check something. And, uh, you know, you're, we're watching pretty much everything these days on the Apple TV. And right. When you go to rewind, it shows you the timeline at the yeah. bottom. So we go to go back a couple seconds and I was really surprised how much time had already passed. Sure. You know, it feels like we're just getting started on this adventure and we're already an hour or whatever into the film. Yeah, it's really difficult to kind of pin down where the story starts, where the, you know, the meat of the plot is. Where the trip begins. Yeah, yeah. because it's so much more of an internal conflict. Sure. The physical aspect of traveling X hundred miles is really an afterthought to can Alvin emotionally and physically sure. get there, but he's battling himself the right. whole way. He's not really battling the lawnmower or sure. battling traffic. They don't play with any of that shit because that's what tends to happen in yeah. you know your average Disney making movie. the journey right. movie. But instead, this it's all internal conflict. Yeah, I wouldn't call this a family feel good film. Right, it's a character study that happens to do a lot of the same things. Absolutely, but it doesn't play on on any of that. You know, you're completely right, though. When you get to the end of the movie and it becomes harder emotionally for him, that part feels like a longer section of the movie. The whole beginning, the whole four-fifths of sure. that part of the movie is, uh, I mean, it's leisurely. Yeah. As myself, a 20-something who has no patience and edits his own stuff like he's working on a fucking crank sequel, I could not believe that I had gotten that far and was just chilling, relaxing, enjoying the Midwest. Because that's what Alvin's doing. And when it starts to become hard for Alvin, when he gets so close, he can taste it. He's kind of in town. He's in that bar. Mm -hmm. If you've ever taken a trip to fucking Wisconsin, you know this yeah. stuff. It's when you are in town at that bar. And people, it's when people basically start to know the person you're coming to see. Right. So much so that you can address their house by their name. Hey, where's this guy live? Oh, yeah, that guy's place is over here. And that's where the, the toll starts to come in. That's where he gets... Uh, very obviously physically affected by this right you know when we get to that that part where his mower stops it's almost i mean we just need that time to collect ourselves before he completes this trip we have another one of those moments that's internally upsetting to us seeing the the kind of shaky drive into the driveway that quiet drive we're expecting something fucking awful like we are through most of the movie to happen because that's just kind of what the david lynch feeling is telling us that foreboding sense. Yeah. But that's also giving us the same feeling when, you know, you've been preparing for something for a long time and that moment's finally upon you. You're nervous. Your your emotions are racked. And that's where you're at in that moment. So when we talked about Burn After Reading last time, we talked a lot about uh, it being character driven. And, you know, we're spending a lot of time with people. I, I think it's fair to say the exact same thing about the straight story. It's very character driven. That might uh, separate it a little bit yeah, from David Lynch's I other stuff. So. Um, not having any sort of nonlinear storytelling or any kind of science fiction element to it or mystical element to, to pull apart or put back together, I guess. So it's all characters. And by the end, uh, you believe that these characters are really just some of the best people alive, some of the best people you've ever met. Hearing him you know, describe the war, for instance... How his uh, his memories of his friends are all their young faces. Right. Because he never knew them to get old the way he looks now. He thinks back to these people he considers his friends. They don't look like him. And, you know, it's one of those moments, there's a bunch of them in the film, where I feel like I'm not just going on that adventure with him, but I'm kind of, I'm growing along that way too. Yeah. I'm, I'm also gaining just as much out of this as he is in kind of different ways. Mm -hmm. It's having these different kind of effects on me. And by the end, I, I can't really remember a time I felt uh, as as displaced as we are right now or where I'm, I'm feeling okay now. You doing yeah, all right over there? Sure. I mean, I've, I felt really good and warmed by 
maybe not directly after the movie, but as the the movie was kind of wrapping up before it hits that emotional peak. Sure. I definitely can't remember a time I felt so good after a movie where I had so little in common with the people in it. You know, I recognize none of these people in me whatsoever. I mean, my day-to-day life shares no common ground with them. We're essentially from different tribes, and still, I love everything about them. I guess next time we're going to lighten up. We're going to be a little bit less complacent, a little bit less happy, a little bit less serious. Um, I think we're going to be just as happy. We that's have, true. Uh, well, firstly, there's a website you can go to. You can see the other David Lynch movies. I don't know if it's exactly on 150, but it's definitely episode 100. It doesn't matter because it's impossible to find them by episode number. Go on the, the page for this episode, click David Lynch, you'll find it. Doublefeatureshow.com, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Starting our path towards 500. So what's the uh, what's the next set on the show? Uh, next time we're going to do some, uh, we're just going to return to some 80s horror. Haven't had some 80s horror time, fun, we happiness. Slash, slash. Uh, so we're going to do Poltergeist by old Toby Hooper and uh, the slasher gem, My Bloody Valentine, which we've been just really trying hard to get on the show. That's all that needs to be said about that. Watch more fucking film. Bye.